a lot of people have a tough time with uh, kind of wrapping their head around the machine because now the string is twisting and the jig is stationary. Everybody always, like you said, would flip the jig around the string. Now this jig is stationary, which a lot of people will put the serving on, they'll actually put it against the twist, which is a big no-no because that will have a lot of peep rotation, just a lot of issues. Michael is uh, far and away one of the most technical shooters out there for sure, um, that I would say. I mean, he knows his gear inside and out and obviously has a great position in the company. It fits him perfectly. <laughs> yep, <laughs> he's uh, working for a living. <laughs> very, very particular uh, shooter, and we wind up on his targets take a lot together, so we have a lot of fun. For the most part, clarifiers are used with scopes i.e. lenses. Verifiers on the, other, on the other hand are similar to reading glasses that fit in your peep sight. Uh, they go from very very low powered to a moderate power. They will clear up your pins. Uh, they're used, they're meant to be for the older archer that wears reading glasses or has to put reading glasses on to write a check or something like that. So clarifiers, scopes, competition, verifiers, think sight pins. Hey everyone, this is Rod White and you're either listening to or watching The Rod White Bow Show. Hey everybody, welcome to the Rod White Bow Show, and I am sitting with a guest at in Paris, Texas, that I had the privilege of shooting with today, Michael Anderson, Specialty Archery Products. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it, wish we would have shot better, but <laughs> can't win them all. I had a couple malfunctions. I've shot unknown quarter yardage courses way better than I did the known ones today. <laughs> That's sad, with knowing there's no excuses. Yeah. See well. it, shoot it, don't miss at your sight. Rod? Well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Twice. And I even, there was one target where Michael and I, I turned around to Michael and I even said something like, uh, man, I'm glad I'm not shooting unknown because I really couldn't judge yardage because I missed set my sight by 10 yards. Like, I don't even know what in the world. But mm -hmm. I, I was aiming well. I was super happy with how I was shooting. I just, I give a dang, was busted after that one. So <laughs> Your line was impeccable on that shot. It was perfectly <laughs> straight up above the 12. 10 yards right. too hot, but it was perfect line. Oh, so. well. <laughs> we'll make it up next time. Yep. Um, so Michael is the general manager at Specialty Archery, shoots for Matthews, and probably hosts other companies. And uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit, uh, those who are out there listening, this show is going to be about clarifiers, verifiers, and bow presses, and all the cool stuff that Specialty makes, because they have, uh, without a doubt, well, I would say you're the originator probably, Specialty is, of the clarifiers, verifier thing. Uh, yes, that's correct. They've been around for quite a few years, approximately 20 years. Um, and one question I get a lot is what is the difference between a clarifier and a verifier? So easy way I tell people to remember it, clarifier has C and scope has C and competition has C. So clarifiers, scopes, and competition all kind of go hand in hand. So um, <clears throat> we have a few different powers of clarifiers and verifiers. Different power clarifiers are paired with different powered lenses, um, but for the most part, clarifiers are used with scopes, i.e. lenses. Verifiers, on the, other, on the other hand, are similar to reading glasses that fit in your peep sight. Uh, they go from very, very low powered to a moderate power. They will clear up your pins. Uh, they're used, they're meant to be for the older archer that wears reading glasses or has to put reading glasses on to write a check or something like that. So clarifiers, scopes, competition, verifiers, think sight pins. Gotcha. So, obviously, we're out here on a 3D course shooting 3Ds. I, I'm, I'm going to say probably a lot of the folks that follow me are not 3D shooters. They might shoot like local, local clubs. Mm -hmm. um, I would think, and I, thankfully I don't have that, but uh, some folks that like have LASIK, I've heard, that the Verify might be a great option for them. J just for the bow hunters out there who have a trouble seeing their sight pins mm -hmm. um, at full draw, they're getting older. What? Is that an option for them, and pluses and minuses that? Uh, definitely, yeah. The Verifier is a more popular product for ours just because it's for the bow hunter, and there's way more bow hunters than there are competitive 3D or target archers in the world. So um, we sell a lot of Verifiers. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, Powers 6, 7, 8, and 9 a few years ago. Uh, people wanted something a little weaker, so we come out with a 5, which is a little weaker yet. Here recently, people wanted something a little bit weaker yet than the 5, so we come out with a number 4, I think, about 4 or 5 years ago. Um, and the number four is about as weak of verifier as produces any effect uh, on a site, so to let you see your pins better. But uh, the number four will still clear up the pin, but it won't disrupt the downrange target very much. And that's the problem with the verifier is they'll clear up your pins, but that's pulling the focus back towards the pins. So the pins look better. Whatever's on the other side of them look worse. So, um, but like you mentioned, bow hunters, and that's... We sell a lot of those to people that don't shoot any tournaments whatsoever. They're strictly and they have no lenses on the front. They so have the no lenses on the front. It. Nope. Now, one thing I have heard of recently, we don't recommend this, but I'm a big believer, and if it works for you, by all means, use it. Uh, 
people as they get older that do this game 3D as well, they can't see their pins either, but they want to shoot a little bit of magnification. So some people have told me they shoot a low-powered verifier, such as a four or a five, with a low-powered scope lens, such as a two or three or up, maybe up to a four tops. Um, I look at that and the target is too blurry, but uh, if a shooter shoots it, likes it, and it works well for them, by all means use it. So it's not something we usually recommend, but a low-powered verifier sometimes will work for certain shooters. It all depends on what the shooter wants to see. If the shooter can't see his pins, and he's willing to give up a little bit of target clarity to see that, he may get by with a verifier and a scope. Again, it's not something we recommend, but I have had a few people report that it does work for them. So Gotcha. So um, if, if you're, so let's say you're out there in Montana or you're in Colorado or Iowa and you don't have a shop near you, what, how do you even go about trying to figure out what, what do I need? Like I, I'm having a hard time seeing because I even know like when I'm trying to help others and coach others I'm on what they need for a scope and a clarifier uh, combination, I, I just can't even guess because mm -hmm. there's so many factors that seems to go into that. Definitely eye distance to the peep and distance to the scope. So yep. wh wh where, where would you begin to guess the size? There are actual uh, mathematical, like when you're talking about a clarifier and a scope lens, there are mathematical uh, calculations where you can figure out what should work with what. Where you get into trouble is what the shooter likes to see. Um, we sell, we had the number one, number two, and number three clarifiers for a lot of years. People wanted something between the one and the two, and people wanted something slightly weaker than the number one, which is where the one and a half came about this year, and the point five came about this year. It was something a little bit weaker than the one. We have people that shoot a four power with no clarifier, just a plain aperture. We have people that shoot a four power with up to a, a number two clarifier because they like to see something different. That, that's what gets to be, it does get to be really tough as far as selecting a power because everybody likes something different. We have people that shoot an eight power with a number one clarifier. Um, kind of a rule of thumb we recommend for a four power, a number one, for a six power, number two, for an eight power, number three. People deviate from that all the time. Um, it, like I said, it's whatever works best for you. Same thing with the verifiers. Uh, I can tell you that verifiers, the number four, five, and six, the last time I checked, were about 90% of the sales. Um, those three, the weakest three, were by far and away the most popular. The verifiers, the stronger you go, the better your pins look, of course, but the worse the downrange target looks. So when you're increasing the strength, you're decreasing target clarity, which is kind of why we suspect the four, five, and six are the most popular. Gotcha. Um, so, um, even knowing of prescription, this has been years ago, I had a gentleman tell me he had a 1.5 reading glass prescription and he really liked the number five. So I thought, well, I'll keep that in the, in the memory banks and if somebody has a 1.5, I'll tell him that. And I had another guy tell me he had a 1.5 and I thought, oh, he's gonna tell me he likes a number five. And he said, well, I really like that number nine, which is at the complete other end of the spectrum. He just likes something different than the other guy. And that's, that's where you get into trouble is you can't really say what one person should like or shouldn't like. Now, we can make recommendations, but Overall, it's the shooter kind of has to determine that themselves. With the verifiers, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be a four, five, or six. We recommend a four if somebody's just started experiencing this problem. They have noticed that they can't, you know, I myself started using, I used to fletch arrows. I'd put the jig real close to my nose and I'd get the right amount of glue on it so it wouldn't ooze glue all over, mm -hmm. but you'd get enough glue to make it bond to the shaft sufficiently. And uh, here, just the last couple of years, I can't see that anymore six inches from my nose. I have to hold it out here. So I've started using reading glasses for small detailed work on bows or fletching or whatever. Um, so those guys probably a four. Uh, if they've been fighting for a couple years, maybe a five. If they've been dealing with it for a while and are getting fed up, not being able to see their pins, maybe recommend a six. But the best thing is to go to a shop that's got the tool and take their own bow. We get, I get, during the fall, I'll get five to 15, 20 calls a day. How do I pick which one? And we say the best thing to do is go to a shop and hold your bow up, take your own bow the way you're looking at your own bow, your own sight pins, hold that up on the target, make sure it's a target that's out there 20, 30, 40 yards, normal shooting distance. A lot of people do it at a shop, look at a target on the wall at three yards, look at their look at their verifier display. <clears throat> the verifier display tool, it's kind of like a ruler. It's about six, in, six inches long, about an inch wide, and about a quarter of an inch thick, and it's got all six lenses uh, installed into it. So the shooter holds their bow up, their own personal bow is actually best, like they're shooting it at arm's length, and then look at the four, look at the five, pick whichever one looks best for you. It's kind of like, I tell people, it's kind of like trying on hunting boots. You know, you might wear a 12 or 11 and a half or 12 and a half. 
you have to kind of try them on to make sure they're going to fit correctly. And so you sell them in a kit too, right? Or no? Not the verifiers. Okay. No, just that we we also have an insert that goes in our peeps called a, an aperture, which is nothing more than a plain hole. A lot of people that shoot scopes just shoot a plain hole, for example. They don't shoot a clarifier um, because they like to keep their pin as clear as possible. And the clarifier, I mentioned the verifier makes the target a little bit blurry because it's pulling the focus back on the pins. Uh, the clarifier works with the scope lens and kind of does the opposite. It shifts the focus downrange. So whatever's downrange gets more clear, but it does so at the expense of the level and the pin in the scope. That's the clarifier. Right. So, um, so that likes that's you know they kind of are opposite lenses. So, um, so again with clarifier, it's best to see see each one and, and kind of try it for yourself. We have a clarifier display tool too, but the verifier tool is a lot more popular because hunters are a lot more hunters than than. 3D or competitive target archers. So, and so yeah. to explain what that is, really, it's it's actually um, it's a pretty cool system. It's a you can take it, put it in and out with an Allen wrench, or you guys provide a, a little tool there for it. But you have a re base regular peep housing. It's threaded, and then you can just screw them in and out, change them in and out, like in a blink. Yeah, yep, yep. That that was our apertures. That's I forgot to mention. Yeah, our apertures we do offer in kit. We have five sizes of apertures, and five sizes of clarifiers. Those sizes are going from smallest to largest are one thirty second inch. Uh, three sixty fourths of an inch, one sixteenth of an inch is the middle size, three thirty second is the second from the largest, and the largest is one eighth. And those are the ones that all go on our standard size peep, which is our Pro Series and Ultralight. We've got a little bit larger quarter inch size uh, peep for hunting, and then here uh, a couple years ago released the five sixteenths, which is bigger yet, again more for hunting. Gotcha. So, yep. Well, and when you move to uh, um, the different size apertures, meaning the hole that you're looking through, with the combination of lenses. It seemed like to me almost that if I go to a smaller hole instead of a bigger hole, I can see my pin better with a clarifier scope setup. So if I'm shooting 3Ds, because I want to see my target really, really well, and for me, just my style is shooting movements okay, so I'm not, I'm not focused on the pin at all. I'm looking at where I want to go with the target. But if I get bigger with that, it seemed like that would get um, a lot worse. Cl target might get a little clearer, but my pin would actually start to almost like halo and then almost see like multiple pins. Mm -hmm. So um, yep. the the relationship between those two again, no, somebody not knowing anything. Yeah, rough yep. no. guess. What would you throw them in? What you're what you're describing there is uh, <clears throat> is actually dead on. Uh, the smallest the aperture you can use is beneficial because. Uh, for somebody out there that's familiar with cameras, the smaller you can go with the f-stop or the aperture in a camera, the wider the depth of focus. Basically, the more things that are in clear focus. That's why your pin looks better, the target generally looks a little better, going as small as possible. Now you get to a point of diminishing returns where you start to get lighting becomes an issue with real small ones. Um, a lot of times you can't line up your scope. If you're, when you're shooting, you should look through the center of your peep. Your scope should fit in there kind of nicely to help you aim at the back end. You get too small to where you can't see your scope, it becomes kind of a problem. Um, but it will, just as you've seen, increase overall clarity of both the target and the pit and the sight pin. It's right. it's kind of a trade-off between being able to align correctly at full draw and getting everything as clear as possible. For target archery, most of your scopes are around an inch and a half. So that for those size scopes, our one sixteenth aperture size and our one sixteenth clarifiers are very very popular. One sixteenth and then plus or minus one of the sizes. For three D, where people are generally using a little bit bigger, like a two inch or a like a 41, 43 millimeter scope. You know, ours is 1.750. Uh, for that, people are usually using like a 332nd or 1 8th. Uh, they're losing some of the benefit of a small aperture like you're describing, but again, this, the smaller or the larger scope lets people see the animal's back line, the front leg, so you can tell where to shoot it. Smaller scope, a lot of times, if you're aiming, all you see is fur. Right. You know, you can't tell exactly where you're holding on the animal, especially if you're a first shooter and it's a black target that at 30 yards, you know, you can't see where you're at. So. Right. Then there's um, one more thing on that scopes and clarifiers is uh, I think a lot of people don't understand when you buy a sight, even if you have a multiple pin sight, even the cheaper sight pins, for those of you listening that, that aren't really sure exactly what all we're talking about, uh, alignment is really important. You being able to align your your peep sight up with your sight housing. So where mm -hmm. your circle, that your guard that protects your pins, most target or most hunting sites, excuse me, have a white line or another colored line that goes around mm -hmm. it. And so you're trying to match that aperture size to, so that that ring is just inside of that. Mm -hmm. And then that, that makes sure that it's aligned. It's very similar to, I think, um, if you've ever seen advertisements for the, I think, what are those things called? No peep sites? Um, not the... Um, 
Q Q site. I can't think of it right now. Yeah, I got a thumb my head. I can't. I know what you're talking IQ about. IQ site. That's yes, what it is. IQ both site. Yep. It's basically <coughs> the exact same thing. So, um, you know, really, all you really need is a peep and a good pin guard combination, and and that you do sell in a kit. So I, I'm sure you have like a small and a medium and a large right or something kit where it's just apertures. If somebody was just going to shoot yes. just a peep. Yep. Yeah, we have uh, basically five aperture kits and. If people are just getting into shooting, we usually tell them start with a start with a set of apertures. And once you determine what size you like, which you may like a sixteenth, you know, yep. which is what we recommend for target, you might anchor in a way that lets you see through the three sixty four. So you like that one. At that point, then we recommend trying a clarifier in that size, you know, because then you've got the size already determined, and you don't have to experiment with the sizes and the powers. Once yep. you determine your whole size, then that's the size you should should select for the clarifier. And we've got several different, we've got five different clarifier powers now. So awesome. So yeah. And getting back to talking about aperture size, I always tell people, you know, almost everybody's used to shooting a gun of some sort. You have a front sight and a rear sight. And I imagine, okay, your peep sight is your rear sight. Imagine your rear sight on your gun was a big circle. And your front sight is a pin just like your sight pin or your scope. I always tell people, imagine if you're, if you have like a half inch opening that you're looking through. You can line up and see where you need to aim based on that. Now imagine that opening is like six inches. How much harder is it going to be to center that pin at the front of the rifle up with a great big opening like six inches? It's right. kind of, archery is kind of similar. It's kind of a crude comparison, but I, I use that example a lot. And people, almost everybody shot a gun. Somebody's getting into bow hunting. They're not sure what a peep sight even is or does. I tell them it's just, just like a rear sight on a rifle. And to shoot accurately, you've got to have those lined up perfectly. A smaller peep facilitates that, but you have issues with decreasing light and losing losing the ability to line up around the pin guard like you talked about earlier so yep, yep. well michael is uh far and away one of the most technical shooters out there for sure um that i would say i mean he knows his gear inside and out and obviously has a great position in the company it fits him perfectly <laughs> yep <laughs> he beats working for a living <laughs> very very particular uh shooter and we wind up on his targets take a lot together so we have a lot of fun but um there's a couple other products real quick for those who are are really starting to make strings and it seems like it's a huge fad everybody's got a string business right now mm -hmm. <laughs> tell us just a little bit about that yeah uh well that's that's uh there was really nothing on the industry like it and we had a gentleman on iraqi thompson there especially he's a production guy there and he had a small string business and he and our owner al schuster got together and kind of played around and made up a machine um, one of the early ones was kind of crude kind of loud kind of kind of dangerous it was just kind of something he built for rocky and people started saying no there's nothing like that out there you should look at it so we started looking at costing and you know we knew it was going to be a few thousand dollars didn't know if it was going to be 5000 or 2000 or 7000 but we weren't sure where we were going to end up. So we started looking at some costing and seeing kind of where we were at. And we thought, okay, is anybody going to want to buy any of these if they're a couple thousand dollars, which is where the original Super Server 600, the SS600 was. And we came out with it, you know, had, had some pretty decent interest. And we actually went to the Matthews dealer show that year, and we had taken as many orders for those as I thought we would sell for the whole year. So we're like, okay, well, I guess I kind of underestimated the market for those. So... Um, so we had a 600 for a couple of years and two things that people wanted immediately and uh, I should back up and, and basically the, what the machine does is it will if you uh, you will sell most people will still lay up on a four post and they'll serve the end loops using a four post now if you serve using the tag end myth or you use the actual bowstring you can serve it on the machine but most builders that I know are still laying up on a four post they put it on our machine and they'll twist it on our machine our machine spins the spindles in opposite directions an equal number of turns so you get an even twist rate no peep rotation and at that point, people usually put it on one of our stretchers, our QS350 stretchers. Um, so then they'll lay up the second piece, put it on the machine, twist it, do the third piece, put it on the third stretcher, twist it up. By then, that first piece has been on the jig for 20, 30, 40 minutes. At that point, they'll put it back on the server, and then they'll change the, the motor function of the machine to where both spindles spin the same direction for putting serving on the string. Uh, and it'll it'll do the twisting and serving anywhere between zero and about 400 pounds of tension on the string. So uh, you switch it to where it serves, switch the motor function from twist to serve, and it'll allow you to put the serving on the machine that way. So um, that's basically all the machine does. I always tell people they look at the controller and get a little bit concerned. Oh, look at all these buttons. Well, half of the buttons are, are to enter or take turns away. If you want to put like 1,200 turns in, you can hit 1,000 and then 200 button twice. We'll put 1,200 turns in. If you want to do 1,150, you would hit... 1,000, 100, 200, and then you'd put the minus 10 button five times. That would allow you to take 50 twists away. If you can run a cell phone, you can run the machine. They're very simple to run. So, so the 600 came out a few years ago, and it was it was very popular. Some of the bigger builders, of course, wanted faster, and a lot of people, not even the bigger builders, but smaller builders, wanted a foot pedal. So, 
So we worked on a bigger machine, the SS2500 is one that we offer now, and an SS800 is what we offer now. And we come out with the SS2500, and it has a couple of safety features that the SS800 doesn't. There's a light beam that sits on top of the machine, so if something gets caught in the string, 2500 RPMs, I don't know if you've ever seen that going, but it's cooking. I mean, it, it serves pretty fast. Something gets caught in there and it could potentially pull it into the machine. So I can't remember how fast our guy has that thing stopping, but if something breaks a beam, it stops almost immediately. So it's kind of a neat feature of the 2500. Uh, there's also a big red emergency stop button on the controller on the 2500 that the 800 doesn't have. Um, but uh, we were able to kind of retro engineer the 2500 using the same motors uh, as the 600. Now the power supply, the power supply box, the the brain or not the, the brain box, what some guys call it, changed around completely. It's a much larger box, which is why we were able to get a couple hundred more RPMs out of the motors on the 800 than we were the 600. So now the 600 has been discontinued. We just have the SS 800, which goes a maximum of 800 RPMs, and the SS 2500. Um, of course, most builders are going with the 800, but. Uh, some moderate-sized builders and large builders, a lot of them are going with a 2500, which, like I said, when you hit the foot pedal on that one, it goes, and it goes fast. Right. So, Well, and the reason you would want, um, and, and, and there's a whole lot of technical stuff going on in there, obviously. So if, if you're not geeked out about how learning how to make your own strings and all that fun stuff, that's cool. But there is one thing for certain um, that you should know about strings. Like when you get your strings off from a manufacturer, and certainly not to dog any of them, but some companies – will it will take longer to quote unquote shoot in a bow like in fact if you open and, and i'm not picking anyone it's just but if you open the elite manual for example it says you should shoot your bow like 200 shots or something 150 200 shots before you really start to tune your bow and and probably some of the other manuals do i just noticed that one mm -hmm. the reason they do is because those strings that are that are in there are they're made in a much different system probably i would say i would guess probably a little more cruder system maybe than what you got yeah I, i'm not sure what they're Right. particular yeah techniques but are so what, what happens is i think and you correct me if i'm wrong but uh, just having made strings before is that as you're applying your serving typically you have to spin that around the string with your fingers if you don't have any kind of a spin type mm -hmm. stringer like you have so when that goes around there if the tension isn't kept equal as it goes all the way across which obviously using your fingers is not going to be nearly as precise as like a machine like yours that's spinning at a constant rate mm -hmm. you'll see more twist actually happen underneath the serving and then get towards the end of it and it, it may have actually had not quite as much twist under there and then the string what they term call string stretch there probably is some again this is just my thought but mm -hmm. there there probably is some wax that bleeds out of the strings which would elongate it somewhat and that would lead to some string stretch as as a bow gets hot like say you left it in and you shouldn't do this in a car or somewhere in a really warm environment but the other thing that happens it seems like too is as you're shooting um over and over and over again that hundred and some shots that they recommend it it, it allows those twist to kind of re-equalize themselves so it's uniform throughout the string which is going to lengthen out the string as well mm -hmm. and that's what i think like that's why it's really important to, to shoot arrows a lot and and there are some string builders that de definitely are building with your machine that are kicking out some incredible I, I don't notice as much string stretch but it seems like to me honestly almost any set you get moves a little bit initially mm -hmm. and that's one of the big pluses i've seen with your string the, the strings that i know were built with yours there's very very little um after stretch which for me building bows for a lot of people and myself obviously it seems like i build a bow right before i come to tournament all the time and mm -hmm. just to a bow. <laughs> maybe i'll switch change tomorrow <laughs> mm -hmm. but it it literally um it saves me a bunch of headache and 150 arrows may not sound like a lot but if you really count how many arrows you shoot as a backyard bow hunter that's a lot of arrows most guys won't, probably won't even shoot that before they shoot mm -hmm. yep go out hunt after they get their bow built so it's super important. Strings are a major, there's three major components of your shooting <laughs> accuracy. One is your bow, your strings, um, <laughs> and then, of course, your arrows. So mm -hmm. you got to have them right. So it's a really important fundamental thing. That's why I thought it would be kind of cool to talk about it. Yep, yeah, that's that's one thing that uh, if you apply the twist from one end, they will all get compacted in one end. And over time, they will equilibrate, you know, because if you keep tension, constant tension on it. But the twists are going to resist going into the string on the far end more than they are on the end you're twisting from, which is why we twist ours from both ends. They equilibrate a little bit quicker. It just, and it's in our way, in our way of calling it, it's the right way to do things, right. twisting from both ends. Um, and exactly what you said, a lot of people have a tough time with uh, kind of wrapping their head around the machine because now the string is twisting and the jig is stationary. Everybody always, like you said, would flip the jig around the string. Now this jig is stationary, which a lot of people will put the serving on, they'll actually put it against the twist, which is a big no-no because that will have a lot of peep rotation, just a lot of issues. 
So a lot of people do that, and they're like, nope, I did it right. I'm like, whatever you're doing, do it backwards. <laughs> no, no, that's, bad. that's wrong. Trust me. They just have a hard time envisioning, you know, if the twists are going this way, and they're used to wrapping it with, by hand, matching it. Well, also, now that string is twisting, so you kind of have to put it in backwards because now the jig is stationary and the string's twisting. So that's, that's one of the things we've had some people comment about is like, oh, I made a first string, the peep was rotating 180 degrees. And tell them whatever you're doing, do it backwards. Oh, that's wrong. Nope, you did it wrong. Switch it around and do it, you know. But uh, other than that, yeah, the machines, it's just, a, it's just a simple. And I always tell people, if you can run a cell phone, you can run this machine. It's, it's very simple. Once you get the hang of the machine, people very rarely change the motor speed. They'll change the direction and they'll change the function as far as twisting and serving. And they will change the direction depending upon if they're putting a string together as far as putting it on. Or a shop that is replacing a, like, a, like an end serving that's mm -hmm. gotten frayed. Then they'll just switch it to reverse, pull it off, switch it forward, put the serving back on, and you're done. So, Gotcha. Yep. And so one last question about strings is mm -hmm. um, uh, there are string makers, a lot of them, that, that um, they, they say they pre-stretch their strings up to, some of them say up to 900 pounds. You mm -hmm. mentioned something to me one time when we were talking about it. Yeah. Is, is yep. there really a breaking point at which it doesn't make sense? It, or We've talked to the guys at BCY. Um, they're they're kind of friends of ours, and uh, you know they've recommended three times the peak weight of a bow, which is you know for an 80 pound bow, 240 pounds. Um, and you know you can. It seems like most builders I know that I respect and I know that put a good product out are in that 300 to maybe 350 pound range. Um, but you know, guys, more and is better. This is tension. Just so those of you are listening, that's you're pulling like. They, he puts them on. <clears throat> there's two hooks on there on the string jig, if I remember right, and mm -hmm. it. It's pneumatic. Is it pneumatically run? That it's pneumatic. Yeah. Yep, the tension is pneumatic. And we went with pneumatic. String. Yeah, we went with pneumatic because we had a spring set up early. And uh, <clears throat> with a, the disadvantage of a spring is you put it on there, and when you twist it, the tension goes through the roof. Because as you're twisting it, you're shortening it, and that spring is getting pressed more and more and more. So the tension changes. Whereas air, it will bleed off. Just like if you twist it up and let it sit there for 20, 30 minutes, as that string stretches, the tension goes down. So your tension is not as consistent with a spring as it is with air. Gotcha. Um, that's why a lot of guys will hang just physical weights off it, because 50 pounds is 50 pounds. Put you know, five of them on there, that's 250 pounds. It's always consistent, whereas a spring isn't as accurate. That's why we went with the pneumatic system. And yeah, our machine has a fixed end and then a movable end. And the movable end basically consists of two bases, one of which you lock down and has an air cylinder, and in the movable base, which holds the uh, the far end of the hook, that's where the tensioning occurs. The air cylinder will move that that half of the machine, basically. And again, you can tension it from anywhere between zero up to like 375 pounds with a with a 150 psi compressor. So that's all um, super techy stuff, oh. obviously. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, if you're at all into strings, that, you know, review this multiple times and you'll start to understand as you start to play with a string jig machine, you'll start to understand why those benefits are there. I, you know, a lot of people might look at it and say, wow, man, that's a lot of money to build your own strings. But I'll tell you, if you're out here shooting on a tournament circuit, for example, or you're going on a $250,000 sheep hunt and you don't have a reliable string maker, mm -hmm. it could be worth it. I mean, we're shooting for what, I don't know, I forget what all the contingencies are, but what, Matthews is 12 Five uh, I think so. I think it's twelve five here for this tournament. So. Yeah. So suddenly a string jig, the price point you have it at, doesn't seem like that big of a yep. deal, especially if you're going to do this as a career. Yep. Um, another, uh, the last uh, little subject I want to talk about, which is unbelievably awesome. <laughs> you sent this to me, and mm -hmm. I, I just I, thanks a lot because I can't appreciate it enough. In fact, the dealer that we're doing it at, Daryl Stein and Steen, and excuse me, Select Archery, he wants he wants it like <laughs> when we're done. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that's going to leave my hand. <laughs> <laughs> this press is super incredible, and there are a lot of presses out there in the market, obviously, and there are some that are a little cheaper. But what um, the press that especially Archery has, it has some unique features to it. One of the coolest things I was like, wow, that's the, one of the most intelligent things I can't believe nobody's ever thought of before is you can, at, you can as you press your bow, you can um, pull your string up and actually mm -hmm. check your timing and adjust your timing while it's at full draw. So mm -hmm. if you're a solo guy, I mean, I don't have in Southeast Iowa, I don't have really a lot of people hanging around me that even understand bows or really care. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm pretty much solo. That that drawboard feature where you can rotate your cams and have pressure, that was unbelievable. And then it had 
the cool thing was, I think, I don't know, almost the it's like the simplest thing, but one of the coolest things mm-hmm. is the ser- ability to serve your string, pull it up a little bit, and set it on some hooks mm-hmm. and serve. Dude, totally genius. Yep, yep. Uh, well, the press was actually designed by Ed Horn. Um, he's a gentleman from Iowa there. We purchased a company from him a couple years ago. We saw it was a good product. It was, uh, yeah, the press is great by itself. I mean, it's just, it's a simple, bulletproof press. Uh, there's a lot of great presses on, presses on the market. What I liked about it was the ability to attach the drawboard to the center jack stand and do your work with the bow right on the press. Like you said, time it. You can time it without taking it out of the press. It used to be I would put it on the press, or right on the drawboard, I'd pull it back. Okay, i got to add at least a turn to this one. I had to let it down. I go over to drawboard, put it on drawboard, pull it back. Okay, got to go half turn here. I put it back on the press. Inevitably, I'd put the wrong twist in the wrong side. Well, now I'm twice as far out. Okay, I put them in the wrong side. So I'd have to take, I mean, take you a half hour to tune a bow or to time a bow perfectly. Now you can do it in five minutes, literally. Um, you put the bow in the press and <clears throat> put the bow in the press, uh, secure it properly. We've got some instructions on that. You bring it folder on, you can check the timing. Well, at that point, what you do is you run the run the limb swing arms with the limb ears. The limb ears are the part that actually contact the bow limbs. You run them up to where they're just about touching the bow limbs. And at that point, you can let the bow down on the drawboard. At that point, the limbs will start to go forward as if, like during the shot cycle, they contact the limb ears, and you don't have to go much farther, and everything goes slack. You can add a twist, take a twist away, right on the press, pull it back, check it there. I mean, it, it makes the process slick and easy like five minutes yep another thing is a competitive shooter i'm sure you've probably known that uh you know this is back years ago when i first discovered this when i first started shooting really good scores i had had one this is a rival pro days actually matthew's rival pros i had one that was shooting the lights out and one that was just not doing quite as good and i checked i just thought well i'm going to check the draw links and there was about a little more than an eighth of an inch difference in those bows and I thought, well, it can't be really the same. I can't remember how many mm-hmm. twists I put in, the, in one of the strings or cables to get them both absolutely dead on perfect. But instantly, the scores then were, I could grab either bow and have full confidence in either one. And the, the pro draw actually has a scale on it, too, so you can match two bows dead on perfectly to get the same exact draw length. That's, that's another feature that I like about it. For somebody that has multiple bows, they want to be exactly the same draw length. You can set them to within a sixteenth of an inch if you want to. So. Yep. And for a, a bow hunter, like, uh, I'm not, when I was sponsored, obviously, like, I had, boy, I don't know why, I got, like, 14 bows a year, I think, mm-hmm. from Matthews, because we shot, at the time, we shot IBO, mm-hmm. ASA, uh, Target. Cabela's, Cabela's, Target, yep. and hunting, and then, of course, for Olympic stuff for me, I mean, it was, and you had to have backups, plus, and as a competitive shooter, I would, if, if your funding allows it, I would really encourage you to have three, and what I do with three bows is, I set my number one bow up, my first bow, mm-hmm. and then I grab another bow and try to make it shoot as close to good as I can as that one. And sometimes it becomes my number one bow. Mm-hmm. And then those are my two that I carry to tournaments in case there's something really bad that happens. Mm-hmm. And then a third one that I will tune the third one up and then swing around and do my best to make it my number one bow. Because once mm-hmm. I get a number one bow shooting, and I do this for hunting, obviously, we just two bows for hunting too. But my number one bow, once I have it shooting extremely well, I don't want to shoot it anymore because mm-hmm. I don't want any chance of anything going wrong with it, any blade fatigue, any anything, you know, if, if mm-hmm. it's got a blade on it for a rest or what, whatever the case may be. I just don't want those things changing. So um, that's – I don't know how you can function really without a quality bow press. And, mm-hmm. and you guys just got one that's just over the top. So. Yeah, yeah, if you're tuning to the degree that uh, – I hate to say a lot of shops don't tune to that degree, you know, which it just depends on their clientele. And, and even amongst friends of mine that I work on their stuff, they're like, do you want me to do this? No, just get it to where it's tuned. Well, okay, that's it, fine. And, and real quick, just mm-hmm. to define that, I, I did it mm-hmm. in another podcast. It's, or I shouldn't say define, not, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but mm-hmm. uh, to clarify, there are a lot of great shops out there that the thing is with the archery industry that's a little bit different or weird or funky is when you buy a bow, all of their profit margin is in the bow. Most shops don't charge to put a bow together. Mm-hmm. And if you're trying to make a bow shoot to the level like Michael Anderson is or Rod White is or name any other pro shooter, you're talking sometimes, I mean, definitely days, if not weeks sometimes with a bow to make it shoot. Mm-hmm. So yep. it, it's not that an archery shop doesn't have the capability, but profitability-wise, like, mm-hmm. I mean, they're making less than a dollar an hour sometimes you spend that kind mm-hmm. of time. Yep. That's why they don't do it. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. I mean, to get a bow shooting well is, you know, you got to get it set up and, like I said, you put all your accessories on it. You don't just slap an air rest on it, shoot it, and expect to shoot, you know, 60X scores or, you know, 30X baby X scores with it. It just doesn't happen. you got to get it peep sight's got to be right uh, a lot of times you can make a bow hold better by moving your knocking point up or down slightly you know all these things that 
well, this isn't working. I got to right. try something different. And it's not as simple as just flipping the switch. You got to actually kind of start from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly true. Well, and the whole key is write things down. I don't know how many times you'll hear me say that in my podcast career here or whatever, but write them down so that you can see mm-hmm. what moves, what doesn't move and go back to things that were working and weren't working. So mm-hmm. yep. that's why I love yep. having a podcast and conversation with you because I, yep. I <laughs> very detail oriented. Yep. <laughs> Awesome. Yep. Well, Mike, dude, I super appreciate it. Sure. Thanks a you bunch. bet, Rod. And, uh, you bet. Let's, yeah, uh, if you got any questions, you know we're getting a hold of me at the factory. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'll have links to your stuff on the podcast sure. notes. Yep. And obviously, um, you know, it should be a list of your sponsors yeah. and stuff. I'll yeah. Put on there, but. Okay, yeah. And then if you have any questions as it relates to especially Archer or anything, you know, Matthews or whatever, you can email me at uh, M as in Michael. Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, and that is at Specialty Arch, like our company, Specialty Archery, but without the E-R-Y. So it's M Anderson at SpeciallyArch.com. And website? Uh, www.SpeciallyArch.com. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. Hopefully tomorrow uh, we both shoot them up and get the dig out of our holes that we're in for now. You're in a lot better position than I am at the well, moment. Well, I'm still down there. I don't think they have 14 tomorrow, do they? And I'd have to hit I about am, all of them. Yeah, actually, you. Mike Trail's sitting across from us. I'm just going to go over there and ask him if he can throw some 18s up for, <laughs> for me specifically. Back so. on the back on the rear leg of the animal <laughs> or something, either right. hit a five. If, or, yeah. if I hit the deer in the eye or if I hit the boar in the eye, I get like 35 points. Oh. I'll be back in the game. <laughs> oh, embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, well, it'll be uh, – It'll be fun tomorrow regardless, and great venue here at the ASA. And as always, Mike and those guys do a great job. So if you've mm-hmm. never been to an ASA, get your tail to one because you'll have a lot of good times. Yep, yeah, even if you're just a bowhunter, it's a fun game to it's a fun game to come play. Yep. You know, and come hang out with your friends. And Michael's here along with, like, there's a lot of other vendors here, obviously. If you want to test and try out products, this is the place to come because you can, you can test out your clarifier and peep combination, for mm-hmm. example, and you can test out releases from some companies. Whatever the case may yep. be, it's a, it's a really cool resource. Yep. Yeah. There's several tournaments too throughout the country throughout the year, and we get people that you know, like Rod was mentioning earlier, how to try a verifier or clarifier. I have, I can't tell them how many people come up to the show here. I've always wanted to see one of these. Can I take this to the practice course? And that's what's nice. Go ahead, take it. We'll, you know, go ahead and go try it. That's yep. the best way to like trying on hunting boots. You almost have to try a lot of them before you can Absolutely. decide. So. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. We're gonna get out of here. We need to go get some food in us. I little, hear you. Yes, sir. Or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Peace out. All right. Thanks, Rod. Yep, see ya. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Rod White Bow Show. To help me keep more content like this coming, I would be super appreciative if you could subscribe, like, and share this episode on your own favorite social media platforms. And as always, feel free to make comments in the section below. By commenting, you're not only giving me more direction about the information that you want me to deliver to you in the future, but you're also helping me reach more people just like us. And as a thank you for your support, the first 50 people that sign up after the show for my new online course, 60 Day Elk Training, will receive a free extinguisher game call valued at $29.99 with an instructional DVD where I walk you through how to communicate with mature whitetails and bring them tight into bow range. Thanks again for tuning in.